Praise the Lord. We welcome you. Hallelujah. Please be seated if you would. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Please be seated if you would. We welcome you this evening. Glad that you're here to worship the Lord, to minister unto Him. Praise God for what He is doing in your life. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'd like to welcome those that would be here for the first time. If this is your first time, would you raise your hand? Praise God. I think we have a couple that are right there that are here for the first time. We welcome you. Glad that you've come. Hope you got it. Did you get a good news for you? One of our 12-page public. Good. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hope you take the time to read it, sharing the gospel of salvation, receiving the Holy Spirit, healing, deliverance. God wants to bring forth great things in our life. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord for what he is doing for you. We're going to receive our offering as we bring up our tithes and offerings unto him. Father, we thank you and we praise you for the opportunity to bring up tithes and offerings to you. We give freely, we give excitedly because we want to. As we sow, we know we're going to reap, and we thank you that you're multiplied in the seed sown. We thank you that you are causing all grace to abound toward us, that we have all sufficiency in all things and may be able to abound to every good work. Father, thank you for meeting the need of every individual in this place according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Ushers, please wait on the people, if you would please. Praise God. Our regular service times are Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, Sunday evening at 6.30, Wednesday at 7. We also have intercessory prayer on Thursday nights at 7 o'clock. We have evangelistic teams that go out on Friday and Saturday, preaching the gospel out on the streets, reaching people with our good news for you in the tracks. We also have our deliverance ministry on Saturday from 10.30 to 12. First, we make appointments with you where we can sit down and talk to you about the specific areas of need, begin to minister healing and deliverance to you. Praise God for all the things that He's doing in your life. And we encourage you to be a witness for the Lord. Preach the gospel. Share the word with others. They need to hear the truth. Praise God. We're going to pray for all men, pray for our nation before we get into the word. Father, we thank you and we praise you for the opportunity for all the things that you are doing in this earth, reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray you, the Lord of the harvest, that you're sending forth your labors. They are preaching the gospel boldly as they are. And we thank you for that word sown in the hearts of the people. Thank you for bringing revelation, opening the eyes of their understanding, bringing them to the place of repentance, of acknowledging that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for convicting them of the sin of not believing on Jesus and them receiving Jesus and being born again. Father, we thank you for the great harvest of souls that you're bringing forth in these last days. Now, Father, we do pray for this nation. We bind the principalities, the powers, the rulers of darkness, the spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. We cast them down and throw them down and root them out and fall upon them to their destruction. All the evil spirits operating through those that are ungodly, we bind those spirits and loose their hold from them. Father, we thank you for all the plans of the enemy coming to naught. We thank you that there will be nations that will be saved in this last days. We thank you that we are the righteous and we are standing in the gap, remitting the sins of this nation from its founding to this moment. We thank you as we, your people, called by your name, who humble ourselves and pray and seek your face and turn from our wicked ways. We know that you hear from heaven. You forgive us our sins and you heal our land. Father, we thank you for shaking this nation and doing whatever is necessary to bring it to repentance. And thank you for bringing the righteous into positions of authority that will do what is right in your sight. Thank you, Father, for all that you're accomplishing to do your miraculous work to turn this nation back to righteousness. We praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise God for what he is doing. Hallelujah. Stand with me if you would. We're going to pray as we get into God's word this evening. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth. We receive your word this night, written in our heart and in our mind. We thank you for the revelation of it. We praise you for all that you bring forth. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated if you would. Tonight we're going to share on a subject called How to Minister Effective Deliverance to Believers. God wants us to minister effective deliverance to believers. We don't want to make mistakes. We want to be effective. There's all kinds of people that are ministering all kinds of things out there, and we need to be sure that we're doing things correctly, accurately, and also being effective. In Mark chapter 16, verse 17, These signs shall follow them that believe. 
in my name shall they cast out devils. That means every believer is to cast out evil spirits. We're going to do it through the name of Jesus, which is the means of authority, the power of attorney given to us to release the authority delegated to us. You and I, we've talked about in the past sessions that we have authority in Jesus Christ and that we now are engaged in the spiritual warfare and conquer the enemies in our life. And we're going to, one of the ways is we are going to minister deliverance to cast out evil spirits. If we're going to do this, any person we come in contact with, first, we must, must spiritually locate them. We must be sure that they are born again. You don't just go and minister deliverance to anybody. You only minister deliverance to believers in Jesus Christ. John chapter 3, verse 7, Jesus said, Marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. Every person is to receive Jesus as personal Lord and Savior and be born again and right with Him. And this is important because in the New Testament, when we're born again, what do we become? Children of God. We're now a child of God. We're an heir of God. We have a right to all the promises of God. When Jesus was here, there was a woman who sought deliverance for her daughter. And in the midst of that conversation, Jesus made a statement. He said, he answered and said, It's not meat to take the children's bread, which was deliverance, and to cast it to dogs. Notice, he said that it was the children's bread. That meant it belonged to those who were the children under covenant. In the Old Testament, they were under covenant. In the Old Testament, they had a right to it, but nobody had authority to be able to cast them out. In the New Testament, who are the children of God? Those who are born again believers. So the children's bread is for believers in Jesus Christ. It is deliverance because it is our right now that we are born again. We are heirs of God and children of God. He said, and cast it to the dogs. The dogs are those who are outside of the covenant. It is the children's bread. It belongs to every single Christian. Do we cast out demons out of unbelievers? The answer is no. Why would that be? Number one, they don't have a covenant with God. They don't have a right to it. Number two, if you did, would they be able to retain their deliverance? The answer is no. The reason is because in Matthew 12, verse 43 to 45, it says, When the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest and finding none. He says, I will return into my house from whence I came out. That means the demon would like to come back in. And when he's come, he findeth it empty, swept and garnished. What's going to happen? Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in there and dwell there, and this last state of the man is worse than the first. That means the evil spirits could come back in after they're cast out. Why would they come back in? Well, if you don't know how to walk in the ways of the Word of God and, and be able to resist them. So who is deliverance for? Deliverance is for believers because they can resist the enemy and they can walk in the ways of the Word of God. It is not for unbelievers. We do not cast out demons out of unbelievers. What do you do for unbelievers? We preach the gospel to them and help them to get born again. So now they are in relationship with God. Deliverance is only for believers. If you cast them out of unbelievers, you're actually doing a disservice to them because they are going to get worse. They can't hold their deliverance. There's lots of people that do out there and minister deliverance to unbelievers. It's a mistake. It is contrary to the Word of God, and it's something we do not do, and we're never going to do that, because they're not going to be able to hold their deliverance, and they will get worse. The second thing, we must have that person that we're going to minister to be sure that they are right with the Lord, and certainly when we lead them in a prayer, we're going to lead them in a prayer to confess their sins. 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Everybody's got to get cleansed from all unrighteousness so they're in right fellowship with the Lord. If we're walking in sin, we've given place to the enemy. He's going to be able to work. We're not right with him. Are we going to be able to operate in our authority? Are we going to be able to receive anything from the Lord and hold it and walk in it? No. So we must be sure that people who are coming for deliverance have dealt with their sins, and that's important. I've had people come to me over the years, and even since I've been here, that came, they were very sincere, they wanted deliverance for particular problems, and they were even Christians, they were born again, but they weren't walking right. I remember one woman that came, and she wanted deliverance, and as I began to talk to her, which I always make appointments, you'll hear about that later, why I do what I do, I found out in discussing things with her, she was living with her boyfriend, and she wanted to get deliverance. I said, well, 
you're not right with the Lord because you're living in sin. You can't be living with your boyfriend. That's fornication. He said, you're not right with the Lord. And so I, of course, told her that she needed to repent. She needed to get out of that situation. Uh, or if she had any intentions of marrying him, she needed to marry him. She certainly couldn't be you know, th thinking that she's going to receive deliverance in that particular situation. So, of course, she, I told her that she couldn't minister to her, and she went her way. You just don't minister just to anybody just because they want something. You must be sure that they're born again and they're right with the Lord. A second, another thing that, that must happen is they must really have a true repentance in their life. A person must repent. They can't be one of these that confesses their sin and then continues to go on into things over and over and over. Now, if they're sincere about trying to overcome it and they're really striving against it and they're really coming against those spirits and working on casting them out and they're progressing, then that's good. They're progressing well. As long as they're seeking with their heart to want to get free, then that's good. We're moving in the right direction. But if, let's say, we have some people that they don't even have any intention about dealing with their sins whatsoever and they just want to keep on walking in their own ways, no. But you need to have a godly sorrow that works repentance, a changing, a turning around. Repentance means to change the mind. We're going to change our mind now and walk in the ways of the Lord. And that is so important. Another thing that must happen is every person must forgive any person who's wronged them or hurt them. And that is very important. If you're abiding in unforgiveness, are you forgiven of your sins? No. Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 says, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. See, God operates, of course, according to the covenant. We come into covenant relationship when we're born again. So if we forgive men their trespasses, then according to the covenant, God will forgive us. But suppose we don't. If we won't forgive men their trespasses, are they going to be able to receive forgiveness? No, our Father will not because they've not met the conditions for the covenant promise to come to pass. Therefore, we must forgive. The person must forgive every person who's wronged them or hurt them. If they're going to abide in unforgiveness, say, well, I can't forgive this person or that person because of what they did to me, they're not a candidate for deliverance until they've come to the place of getting right with the Lord. Forgiveness is a decision at the point of our will and obedience to the Word. It's not based on our feelings. It's not based on anything about what's happened in the past. It's all based on a decision to obey God and do the right thing. What happens if we do not forgive? <clears throat> it talks about down here in Matthew 18, 34, where the guy who would not forgive the small debt that was owed him after he'd been forgiven a big debt, it says the Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. And then in verse 35, it brings out the same principle shown that you'd be turned over the tormentors if you don't forgive, get forgiven of a small debt, even though you've been forgiven of a big debt, and that is, so likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from your hearts forgive not every brother their trespasses. Have we been forgiven of all of our sins by Jesus? Absolutely. We've confessed our sin and repented. He's forgiven us of a great debt, all the sins we've ever committed. How can we not forgive any person of this, whatever forget, sins they've, they've done to us? A small thing. No, it's got to be from your heart. It's got to be genuine, a genuine forgiveness. Therefore, if a person will not forgive, then you don't minister deliverance to them until they come to the place of choosing to forgive. Another thing that when you minister to people, you're going to lead them in a prayer on these things, and you're going to deal with the inherited generational curses that have come in, in John chapter 20, down in verse 23, the Bible says, Whosoever sins you remit, remit means to send away. You and I have authority to remit or send away the effects of sins. They're remitted unto them, they're sent away. We see that Jesus actually did this in Luke chapter 5. In Luke chapter 5, we come down to verse 20. This is the one who was born of four, came down through the tile of the roof to be healed. Verse 20, when they saw their faith, he said unto them, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. Now many people think that, oh, that means those sins were cleansed. Well, remember, this is in Luke 5. Had Jesus been to the cross yet? No. Had the blood of Jesus been shed? No. Our sins, we could, he's still under the old covenant. Could the sins be washed away in the old covenant era? No. It could only be washed away in the New Testament. So what was happening here? 
When the word forgiven is this word of me, which means to send away. He was sending away the effect of their sins. And what did that do? Of course, the scribes, the Pharisees got all bent out of shape and said, who speaks blasphemies? Who can send away sins but God alone? Jesus perceived their thoughts and said, what reason in your hearts? He says in verse 23, whichever is easier to say, thy sins be forgiven or sent away from thee, or to say, rise up and walk. Of course, but you may know that the Son of Man has authority. The word power here is not dunamis, which means power. It's the word exousia, which means authority. Young's corrects the King James error when he brings this out as authority. He says, you may know that the Son of Man has authority upon earth to remit or send away sins. Well, what, are, what is our status today? We are in Christ and we can do the same things that he did. We have authority to remit sins, send away the effect of the sins. Of course, this guy ended up, he said, arise, take up thy couch and go into thine house. And he was healed. And that was the result. The man ended up getting healed. Immediately arose up before them and took up that there whereupon he lay and departed his own house glorifying God. What does that show us? That shows us the fact that we have authority to remit sins. Why do we need to remit sins? Please be quiet over there as we're taping this. Remitting sins. Remitting sins is important. In Numbers, chapter 14, verse 18, the reason why we need to remit sins, Numbers 14, verse 18, says, The Lord is long-suffering of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. What's that tell us? Everybody is affected by inherited generational iniquity curses that come down the line that we're being affected by three or four generations. That means I'm affected by the sins of my parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, and even great-great-grandparents. That's important to us to know. That's why we see inherited generational iniquity problems. Why does cancer come down the line? Diabetes down the line, heart problems down the line, alcoholics down the line, all these problems. It's all inherited generational iniquity curses that are coming down the line because of the sins of the forefathers. And that is important to know. In fact, we must understand there's two aspects to a curse. This is an inherited generational curse. One aspect to it is the cause of it. In Proverbs 26, in verse 2, where it says in the last part of this verse, the curse causeless shall not come. There's a cause for every curse. That means things just don't happen. We may not realize it, but things ha re happen for a reason. There is a reason. And many times it's inherited generational sins that have caused problems to come into our life. From, and, and these inherited generational curses from the sins of the forefathers are enforced by evil spirits that come in, and they come in at the time of conception. There's two aspects of the curse, the cause, and then also the evil spirits that come in to enforce that curse. So in order to minister a per to a person, they've got to be born again. They need to have confessed their sins. They need to be sure they've forgiven every person. And we also want to remit the sins and iniquities of their forefathers because we want to deal with every area where spirits have come into them. We're going to close the door, essentially, to all the areas where these evil spirits have come in by dealing with all the sin areas, which are the cause for it. The next thing that's important is we must teach the principles of deliverance and answer the questions that they have. It is important that people be taught the Word of God on deliverance so they understand the fact that we have authority over the demons, we are to cast them out, how we cast them out, and the, show all the principles that are important to, in order to, for them to see deliverance come forth in their life. Answer any questions that they might have. Some people have questions. They, they've heard other teachings, they've heard other traditions, they might you know, not understand some things, so we need to take the time to teach them the principles of deliverance and answer questions. That's why I always set up appointments with people to sit down and talk to them about the area of deliverance and give them a teaching and answer questions and help them to come to the place of understanding deliverance, knowing it, because you just don't want to minister deliverance to someone if they don't understand what's going on. We need to be taught first. Jesus would teach the, God, teach the word to them and then he would minister to them. We do the very same thing. Also, during the teaching, we point out to them the fact that deliverance is a process, and that's another important thing that we need to really drive home to people. 
Deliverance is a process of systematically casting out the evil spirits that have come into us from inheritance, from our own sins, or from victimization in life. It is a process, a little by little process, of driving them out. And this must, must be really driven home because a lot of people come for deliverance and they just want to get delivered just in one shot and that's all I got to do. Well, we know that deliverance is a process of systematically casting out the spirits because we can have a lot there from inheritance, our own sins, and victimization. In Exodus chapter 23, we see this shown, this little by little process, when it speaks of how the enemies were driven out of the land when the, the Israelites went to possess the promised land. Exodus 23, 30 says, By little and little I'll drive them out from before thee until thou be increased and inherit the land. Little by little. The physical in the Old Testament is important for us because they are physical types and shadows of spiritual realities in the New Testament. Pharaoh is a type of Satan. Egypt is a type of the world. The exodus out of Egypt where they ate the lamb is a type of us coming out of the world by receiving Jesus who is the Lamb of God. We get, get born again. They had to eat him. There's a type of us taking him into us and we get born again. God gave him a physical promised land which is a type of the spiritual promised land, which are the promises of God that you and I are to possess. In order to go and possess that land, did God take them away from their enemies? Did he just let's go in there and settle? No. He led them up against all their enemies. And they had to confront them all, and they were all over the place. Canaanites, Hivites, Jebusites, Gergesites, Amorites. They're in city after city after city after city, area after area. All those physical inhabitants are a type of the spiritual inhabitants, which are the evil spirits that are in us. And we must confront all of these and cast them out in order to get delivered from their effect in our life. Each city is likened to an area in your life. You might have an area of anger. You might have an area of rebellion. You might have an area of rejection. You might have an area of fear. You might have an area of lust. You know, you might have an area of diabetes, whatever. They're all different areas. And so God wants us to go into every area to cast out all the spirits and to drive them out. This needs to be explained. And we always take the time to explain this to people because we don't want them just approaching deliverance and think that, oh, I'm going to cast out once and that's all I need to do. You know, a lot of places have done that. And the people don't understand that their deliverance is a process and they need to continue to do that. And then they go off and they aren't delivered and they wonder what happened. In fact, especially if, if they don't walk in the ways of the Lord, things come back. I've seen a lot of people say, well, I got worse after that. I've had people come and testify that they've been to different ministries around here and they came back and they got worse afterwards. Why? Because we didn't continue to cast them all out. We have to cast out all the evil spirits and drive them all out. It is a little by little process. That means you're going to be engaging in the deliverance process to drive everything out of you. You will see victory as you consistently cast them out until you be increased, which means to bear fruit. This word increased is a Hebrew word, para, which means to bear fruit. And you'll bear fruit because you walk in the word at the same time. You cast out the negative spirits. You walk in the word to bring the positive things of God in your life. And then you'll inherit the land, which is a type of us inheriting the promise, seeing the promise of God come to pass in our life. Another thing that's important is the person must be willing to do whatever it takes to get free. They must be willing that they're going to be consistent in casting out, that they are going to walk in the ways of the Word of God, that they are going to deal with any sin areas that they might have had in their life so they don't continue in them, and they need to be really working on striving against that area of sin, willing to do whatever it takes, being a doer of the Word. And that's going to be important because Unless they become a doer of the word as they're casting out these spirits, they're never going to become stronger than their enemies to be able to resist them coming back. Psalms 105, verse 24, gives us this principle, where it says in Psalms 105, verse 24, He increased His people greatly. The word increased is the same word that we just saw, para, which means to bear fruit. So this is talking about how he made his people very fruitful, great amount of fruit. How do we get a great amount of fruit? In the New Testament, we see in John 15 that first as we receive the Lord, we begin to walk in his word, we bring forth fruit. Then as we go through the purging, cleansing process, we'll bring forth more fruit. When we come to the place of abiding in him, we'll bring forth much fruit. So how do we get to the place of having a great amount of fruit? We come to abide in Him. It means we, we walk in the Word. We go through the cleansing process to deal with sin, the flesh, 
all the evil spirits, cast them out, get away from the things that aren't of the Lord and the world and so forth, so that we bring forth, and then we come to a place of abiding, so we bring forth much fruit or a great amount of fruit. What's going to be the result of that? That's going to make you stronger than your enemies. That means fruitfulness is very important if you're going to be able to stand, and if the person's not had that pointed out to them, you can cast out spirits every day forever, and if you don't walk in line with the Word of God, guess what? You're going to have them coming back in. We don't just cast them out and have the door open and have them coming back in by not walking in the ways of the Word. We've got to become strong through the Word. And so that's another thing that we point out, that we need to be in the Word of God. Another thing that we point out to people is their motive is to serve the Lord, not just get free of a problem. Most people that come for deliverance initially, they've got a problem in their life, and they want to get free of it. Well, that's good that they want to get free of it. But it's more than just wanting to get free of a problem. The motive, real motive should be to serve the Lord and want to deal with everything in our life and to become holy in all areas. Because God wants to deliver us from everything, not just the one area. You know, say, well, I got this problem, I got migraine headaches or whatever all, and I need to get free of them. Well, that's good, but how about your anger? How about your, you know, disobedience? How about, uh, you know, other areas in your life, you know, that you might, you know, not walk in the right way you should? God wants to deal with everything. Look what it says in 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves, it's our responsibility to do it, from all filthiness of what? Of the flesh and spirit. There's a filthiness of the flesh. There's a filthiness of the spirit. The, all the filthy things that have got to be dealt with. We've got to put away all the fleshly works, crucify the flesh, all these things. And also, the filthiness of the spirit, which is what? There's nothing wrong with our spirit. The filthiness of the spirit are all the evil spirits that have come into us from inheritance, our own sins, or victimization. The normal term that they're called 20 times in the Gospels is unclean spirits. Filthy, unclean spirits. And what's going to be the result as we do this? We're going to perfect holiness in the fear of God. In other words, God wants to bring us to the place of holiness. Deliverance is necessary as part of what we do to drive the enemies out. We also have to deal with sin, turn away from the ways of the world, crucify the flesh, put off all these things, put off the old man, put on the new man. It's all part of the total package. And what's going to be the result? We want to be perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So this is going to be important. You want to spiritually locate people. Just don't go just ministering to someone because they want deliverance. You've got to be sure that they're meeting these conditions because you want to see them get better and you want to see them progress and see victory come in their life. You don't want to see them, you know, uh, just, well, I cast them out one time and then later on they call you up and say, you know, what's the problem here? I got worse or whatever. All It's because you didn't instruct them properly and you didn't point them in the right direction. Or maybe they didn't deal with their sins and you didn't talk to them about dealing with their sins. Or they weren't leering the word. You didn't give them these scriptures. This is why we take the time to share these principles and teach them. And this is very important. Now, so we talked about how we're going to spiritually locate the people we minister to. Next, we want to talk about how to minister effective deliverance to believers. First of all, anybody that's going to minister deliverance must, of course, be born again. They must have received Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior. It's also good if they have received the Holy Spirit. Remember that the Holy Spirit is received after you're born again. First, you get the Spirit of Jesus Christ when you're born again. That's who you receive as your personal Lord and Savior. Then the receiving of the Holy Spirit is subsequent to that. Well, just to show of any of you who do not, are not aware of that, Acts chapter 8, verse 5. Here's Philip going to the city of Samaria, preaching Christ to them about Jesus. The people with one accord gave heed to the things that Philip spake. They received the gospel that he was sharing. And so they got born again. We know that because in verse 12, they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus, and they were baptized. You get baptized after you've been born again, after you've received Jesus. So they were born again. What did they get? The Spirit of Jesus Christ. Well, what next? Verse 14, when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God through Philip's ministry, they sent unto them Peter and John. And what did they do? Who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They laid their hands on him and they received the Holy Spirit. That shows you the Holy Spirit is received after we're born again. 
It was through Peter and John's ministry. Now, some people say, well, if they haven't received the Holy Spirit, can, can they still cast out demons? Yes. I've seen lots of people who didn't receive the Holy Spirit yet that have cast out demons. Why is that? Because you are in, a, in Christ. You're in a position of authority. You now have been delivered from that authority of darkness. You've been brought into the kingdom, and you can cast out the demons through the authority of the name of Jesus as a believer. It is be better to receive the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. At the same time, don't ever sit there and say, well, you can't cast out demons if you haven't received the Holy Spirit yet. It's not true. You can. But it's best, of course, for someone to receive the Holy Spirit. They should want to receive everything. Now, another thing. Unbelievers cannot cast out demons. They will get destroyed by the enemy. In Acts chapter 19, verse 13, here's a case when certain of the vagabond Jews, there were exorcists, took upon them to call over them that had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. They see, they didn't know him personally. They're talking about this other guy, you know. Who were, there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jew and chief of the priests, which did so. Were they going to be successful? No, because they weren't even born again. The evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? That tells you something. The demons know Jesus and they know those who are born again, who are in Christ, who have authority. They know. They, can, they, they, they understand things spiritually and pick it up. The man in whom the he says, who are you? This guy, he says, oh, you're not born again. What are you trying to do? The man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Oh, they got wiped out, didn't they? This is known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling in Ephesus and fear fell on them all and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. All because the fact that it shows the fact that you, the name of Jesus is great and mighty but you've got to be right with God. You can't use it unless you're a born again believer. So believers can't do it. Of course, for the minister to be able to, or someone to minister deliverance to someone, a believer in Jesus Christ, and all believers are to do it, remember? Remember what it said, as we, first verse we gave you, this is not a special ministry just for a pastor or for someone with supposedly a special anointing or whatever. Mark 16, 17, these signs shall follow them that believe. All believers can cast out evil spirits. We have authority. Now, if you're going to do this, you need to be right with God. You, don't, aren't going to be, you don't, can't be casting out the demons if you're not right with God. What do we need to be do? As we mentioned, to be born again. We also need to have confessed our sins, as we saw in 1 John 1, 9, receiving forgiveness and cleansing from all unrighteousness. We certainly should have a godly sorrow that works repentance, as we saw in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, and verse 10. And we certainly must forgive every person. If we don't forgive them, we won't be forgiven. And so if we're not right with the Lord, can we cast out the evil spirits no. Another thing that's important, for someone to be a deliverance worker, one who's going to cast out evil spirits, we see in 2 Timothy chapter 2, over in verse 6, the husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. That means you need to be working on casting evil spirits out of yourself if you are going to go and minister for some, to someone else because you need to be, first of all, a partaker of the fruits in your life before you go forth to labor and minister to others. Therefore, anybody that's going to work in, de in deliverance and minister deliverance, be sure that you're working on yourself. I've had people come in the past that wanted to, to get involved in deliverance, and I told them, are, are you working on deliverance yourself? And if they weren't, they didn't work with me because we're going to do what the Word of God says. We must be a partaker and be a laborer, uh, if we're going to be a laborer, a partaker of the fruits by doing it ourselves. Another thing, the person who is going to cast out demons, they certainly need to understand who they are in Christ. They must understand what has happened to them, that they've got a brand new spirit on the inside of them, and they must know that they are able to conquer the enemies. Because some people, they... they They've cast out the demons, but they really don't know who they are, and they're not really walking in victory, and they get beat up by the devil. We should not get beat up by the devil because we have authority and dominion. Just because you cast them out doesn't mean attacks coming against you are going to wipe you out and cause you a lot of problems. A lot of people have thought that. Well, I don't know if I want to do that because I, I tried to do that once, and I got all these attacks and had all these big problems. Well, if we understand our authority and who we are in Christ and are doing what the Word says, we don't have to have any problems. Jesus did not get beat up by the devil, no. 
We don't have to get beat up by the devil when we're doing the works of God. God, as we cast them out, we can be protected, we can walk in victory, and we can certainly, certainly need to be cast out of ourselves because things that are in us will try to rise up against us, and that's important. That's why you need to be involved in deliverance yourself. Otherwise, the spirits in you will arise against you. Now, you must know that you're more than a conqueror. Romans 8, verse 37, he says that we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. In fact, this is in response to the statement back here in verse 35 and following when it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Well, that would be the enemy, Satan. And it tells you all these different things that he uses. And verse 36 says, It's written, For thy sake we're killed all the day long. We're counted as sheep for the slaughter. The enemy wants to slaughter us. Well, no. And all these things were more than conquerors. That means you don't have to be negatively affected by the enemy if you are understanding who you are and you're engaging in the warfare and dealing with the enemy in your life. You are more than a conqueror. You must also know that the greater one is on the inside of you. 1 John chapter 4, over in verse 4. You're of God, little children, and have overcome or conquered, this nakao is the word, which means to conquer and to carry off the victory. You have conquered and carried him off the victory. Why? Because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You've got to know Jesus is greater than all the power of the enemy. The greater one has come to dwell in you. Another thing you must know is you must know that you are now in a position in the kingdom in authority over all of the power of the enemy. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 says, what Jesus has done for us, who has delivered us from the power, this is again the word exousia, that means authority in the Greek. Young's again corrects the King James error, the authority of darkness, and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. You're a king in the kingdom. You're in a position to rule and reign under Jesus Christ. You're not under Satan's authority anymore. That means you can do something about all these evil spirits. You've got to know your authority. And you must know the fact that now that you've come into the kingdom, as we see back in Luke chapter 9, verse 1, when he called his 12 disciples together, he gave them power. This is truly the word for power. If you notice below, for you here for the first time, I didn't mention these are the Greek words with meanings below in the lower window. It, dunamis truly means power. He gave them power, and here they tra translate it correctly, the word exousia, that means authority, over all devils and to cure diseases. You and I, in Christ, have authority over all evil spirits and to cure diseases. We can destroy the works of the enemy. But you remember, you have to use that to see this happen. Luke 10, 19, Behold, I give unto you power, again the word exousia, King James made it very confusing because they didn't translate things correctly. That's why you have to look up words. Give into you authority to tread on serpents, scorpions, and over all the power, dunamis, the power of the enemy. That also tells you something else. Satan has power. He has power. But you have authority over the power of the enemy, and you can conquer him. And then it goes on and says, nothing shall by any means hurt you. Is that just an automatic thing, just that you speak? No. It all depends on you using your authority. The reason why we know that is because when we put the cursor over the word hurt, we can show the tense voice and mood of verbs, which is very important in many cases. In this case, we see that the mood is the subjunctive mood. The mood of reality in the Greek, you may not know Greek, but just for your understanding, the mood of reality is the indicative mood. But the mood, subjunctive mood, is not talking about something that's a fact or a reality. Instead, it is something that is conditional upon conditions being met. It is something that's speaking something that is not a fact. So, what this is saying is that he's given us authority to tread on serpents, scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall many means hurt you if you met the conditions. What condition would that be? Using your authority to eliminate the enemy's power and to drive him out, which is exactly what we're going to do. At the same time, as you understand your authority, you must also be under authority. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 5, Jesus came into Capernaum, the centurion was beseeching him. He said, The Lord, my servant, lies at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. 
Jesus said, I'll come and heal him. Verse 8, the centurion said, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, because he was a Roman centurion. Speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. This guy recognized something. He understood that when spoken words were, were released, it was doing something. It was bringing healing. Well, he says, for I am a man under authority. See, he understood how things work. He was under authority to the Roman government, Caesar in Rome, having soldiers under me, and I say to this man, go and he goeth to another, come and he cometh, and my servant do this and doeth it. Because he was under authority, he was in authority over the soldiers. You and I must be under authority to the Father in heaven and to the Word of God, and then we're in authority. If you're not under authority to Him, you're not going to be operating in your authority. You need to be sure that you're submitted unto the Lord. Remember the scripture in James 4, 7, where it says, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. What comes first? Submitting ourselves to God. Then you're in a position where you can have, be able to resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Also, we see here how authority works. Commanding words were spoken. He says, Go, and he goeth. Come, and he cometh. Do this, and he doeth it. He said, just speak the word, speak commanding words, and it will happen because authority is released through speaking commanding words. That means you're going to be born again, you're going to know you have authority, and you're going to know how authority works. You're going to speak commanding words to cast the evil spirits out of people in the name of Jesus. Now remember, you're going to do everything through the authority of the name of Jesus. When you are going to minister to people, you're going to do two things. You're going to be speaking commanding words, casting them out, commanding them to come out, as we'll see in a moment, as we see in Mark 16, 17. But also, you need to be laying hands on them, because it says, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. It doesn't even say you have to say anything. God has given you hands that are to lay hands on people to release the power of God flowing through you. It's a doctrine of the church in Hebrews chapter 6, the doctrine of the laying on of hands, which transmits healing power or anointing flowing through you into a person. This is why what we always do, and everybody that works with me does these things. If you're you're, we're, we're going to be sure everybody's following the way of the word. We're not going to have anything contrary, and that'd be anybody that ever wants to be a worker with me is that we're going to command the demons to come out, we're going to lay hands on the people, we're going to release healing power to flow into them, an anointing, because you're going to have deliverance and healing simultaneously going into a person. That's what we want. That's what God wants. And that's how we minister to people, so it brings both healing and deliverance simultaneously into them. As we go to minister to people, the first thing that we're supposed to do after leading them in a prayer of confession of sin, forgiving every person that's wronged them and hurt them, remitting sins and iniquities of their forefathers, and of course being sure they're right, this is when we go to minister to them, we're going to bind Satan. In Matthew chapter 12, in verse 29, he says, How else can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods except he first bind the strong man? It's talking about a strong man's house. Who's the strong man? <coughs> Satan. What's his house? All the demons that are in the person. Remember what we saw? We'll look at the, come back here in a second, where it talks about spoiling his house. Remember what the unclean spirit says in Matthew 12, verse 43 and following? When the unclean spirit's going out of a man, he walked through dry places, seeking rest, find none. He says, I'll return into my house. For once I came out, the demons consider the person their house. They want to stay in you. They want to live in you. They want to reside in you and carry on their destructive work. So, we go back to verse 29. We're going to enter the strong man's house. That's the demonic network that's in us. We're going to spoil his goods, which is all the things that he's accomplished in us. And first, we're going to bind the strong man. We're going to bind Satan and these evil spirits. And then we're going to spoil his house, plunder his house. And how do we do that? by casting out all the demons in area after area of our life to drive them out so our house is going to be cleansed from all the evil spirits, us being the house of God. So God wants us to understand that we're going to bind the demons first, bind Satan and the evil spirits first, and then we're going to begin to cast them out. Now when you cast them out, you're going to speak commanding words, as we've already seen, using your authority. And what are you doing? You're operating your faith. 
God has given you a spirit of faith. 2 Corinthians 4.13 says, We having the same spirit of faith, according as it's written, I believe, therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. God wants us to speak commanding words, and we're going to be speaking because if you believe God's word, you speak. Why do we speak? That releases your faith. It puts the power of God in operation. It, your faith is going to be used to see the demons be cast out as well as the healing power flow into them as you're laying hands on them. Now, another thing that we do is when we're speaking to these spirits, we speak to them by their function. Their name is by their function. Example, Mark chapter 9, verse 25, when Jesus came and he had this foul spirit, he said to him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, he spoke to it by its function. We see that Jesus would speak to deaf spirits, dumb spirits, blind spirits. He'd speak to spirits. Their name was their function of what they're doing. So we're going to speak to them specifically by that function, and we're going to command them to come out in the name of Jesus. Now we go over to Mark chapter 1, and we see this. Here's the case where this man was in the synagogue. It says in verse 23, he had an unclean spirit within him, an evil spirit. And the spirit cried out and spoke out. And we come down to verse 25. And he says, when the unclean, or verse 25, he, Jesus rebuked him saying, hold thy peace and come out of him. Otherwise, he spoke commanding words. He commanded it to come out of him. That's what you're going to speak. You're going to speak commanding words, say, you spirit of harmony, you spirit of anger, you spirit of whatever it might be, I command you to come out in the name of Jesus. You're always going to do everything in the name of Jesus. As you command these spirits to come out, you do it continually until they come out. Why would I have to do it continually if I made a command? Because the demons have power and have ability to resist. We see that Jesus had to do this continually, as you'll see, because the next verse says, the unclean spirit, when it had torn him, it tore at the guy first. It didn't come out right away. It was tearing at the guy, resisting. And then cried with a loud voice and came out of him. How was Jesus doing this? Did he say at one time? No. How can we tell what Jesus did? By looking at the words in the Greek, Jesus rebuked him, saying. This particular word, saying, is in the present tense. The present tense in the Greek means continuous, repeated, ongoing action. In other words, the way you would translate this literally is Jesus rebuked him, saying and continuing to say to him, continuously, hold thy peace and come out of him. Why did he need to continually say it? Because the demon didn't come out right away. As you see, it tore at him. He kept speaking, otherwise he kept releasing his faith, applying authority and power until the spirit was driven out. Please put them on mute, if you would, please. Mark chapter 9. Or vibrate or something. Mark chapter 9, verse 25. Jesus saw the people came running together. He rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto them, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him. Same thing, he commanded him to come out. And notice how he said it here. The word saying again is in the present tense. Notice, the present tense means continuous, repeated, ongoing action. I mean, Jesus continued to say it, and he needed to say it in this case, too, because what happened? Look at happened and what it says in verse 26. The Spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him as he was one dead, insomuch that many said he's dead. I mean, this was even worse than the other case. Notice, it said it rent him sore. And finally came out of him. I mean, this, team, this guy really went through the mill. I mean, he, it was pretty intense for this guy, convulsing him, tearing at him. God wants us to understand that we command the demons to come out continuously until they come out. You aggressively work your faith with power. And these evil spirits then are going to come out of us. Now, how do the spirits come out of us? They're going to release out of you with a breath some means of breath, because that's the way a spirit releases out of a person. There's not a lot that talks about this in the New Testament, but we know, or in, in the Word, we see a couple places here where it said he came out with a loud voice in Mark chapter 1, also over in Acts chapter 8, came out with a loud voice. But we see, actually, we can understand this 
of how a spirit leaves a person, we can understand it from natural life, and we can also understand it from the Word of God. In the Old Testament, the word spirit translated throughout the Old Testament is a word ruach. This particular word ruach, right here you see, translated spirit, the primary thing, it's been translated some 232 times throughout the Old Testament. It's also been translated breath 27 times. This is one case where we see clearly what it's talking about, how a spirit leaves a person. Because it says here in Psalms 104, verse 29, in this part, Thou takest away their breath, they die. What happens at a time when someone dies? Their spirit will leave their body. How does the spirit leave the body? With the last breath. And that's essentially what it's saying. Thou takest away their breath. The word breath here is this word ruach. So it's essentially saying, He took away their spirit through their breath. That's the way a spirit leaves a person. How do the spirits leave a person? Some release of breath, normally yawns, coughs, sighs, burps, belches, some release of breath in some way. That's the way a spirit will release out of a person. If they haven't come out with some release of breath, then that meant they haven't come out. Well, I command them to come out, shouldn't they have gone? Demons have power, and they can resist, and they don't want to come out, and they will try to resist. If they resisted Jesus, you know they're going to resist us. So we command them continually to come out, and they will release out like a yawn, cough, sigh, burp, belch, some means of that the way they release out. Now, if they don't start releasing out again, understand that the demons are resisting. Well, that means we just continue to command them to come out until they start releasing out. One of the things that helps to get the spirits to release out is if they're not coming out spontaneously, you can cough out with deep breathy coughs, which helps to release the resisting spirits to come out of a person rather quickly. I've done this for years and seen this where I went through a list of the problems in people's lives and then I didn't see anything start coming out and so I was commanding them to come out and then I would have them cough a couple times and then the demons would really start pouring out. I can remember one lady, I had her cough out and she's coughed for the next hour and a half, just about straight. They just, it's kind of just unleashed it, and unleashed it. Now you can sit here and wait until they finally come out on their own, but why? Let's try to get them out quickly. The coughing out is also especially important because you want to help get them out before any manifestation. See, a lot of people have approached deliverance and they want to start casting out these spirits but what they do is they just keep command to come out and then all of a sudden the demons manifest, and I'm talking about manifesting in a regular, rather negative way. Throw them on the floor, jerk them around, talk through them, do all kinds of crazy things, you know, fall, there's cases could be fall on the ground and ride like a snake and so forth. That's not a good thing. We don't want that. That's not the demons coming out, by the way. That's the demons manifested and taking control. We don't want that. Instead, we want the demons coming out. So. What's going to help us to get them out quickly? If we've got to get them releasing out. So the coughing out helps to get them to release out. That will help prevent manifestations, for one. Two, if you do have a manifestation suddenly where something starts to uh, uh, manifest in a person, the best thing always to do immediately is get that person to cough out with deep breathy coughs because it releases those spirits to come out of them and it will shut down the manifestations, either immediately or very quickly. I've done this for years. And before I knew about this, I've been doing this for 30 years, before I knew about this when I first started, we had manifestations of things until God taught me how to get these spirits out quickly. And then once we started having this, started getting them to cough and out immediately, we stopped this, all the stopping of the manifestations. And then when we start, had them, if they don't come out quickly, we get them coughing out so they start releasing out, then you know, we st started to get to a place where we didn't see hardly any manifestations ever. Because, the re why do they manifest? Because they're starting to build up in the person and then working against them and start manifesting. You don't want that. The object, of course, is get them out, not bring them to manifestation. Some people think, oh, it's a great thing if the demons manifest and do these things. No, it's not. That means you haven't been affected in getting them out and they've been able to build up in strength. It's not a good thing. Oh, it sensationalizes a lot of people and they go, it's a great thing. We had a great deliverance day because the, all these things happened. No, that's not a great deliverance. A great deliverance is you get them coming out as quickly as possible and they're coming out very well. We do not want manifestations. We want them to come out 
easily releasing out Jan Kopp, Sy, Burp, Belch. That's also the reason why we want to cough out, because a lot of times some people throw up. And I hate to see it, but a lot of times the reason is because they get such an accumulation of spirits in them, that's the way that finally comes out, it bursts out and they have to throw up. Well, that's not the best thing. Why don't we get them coming out quickly so we don't have that happen? See, it's just having wisdom of how to do things. Now, another thing for all of who are, when we're ministering deliverance, there are two aspects to effective deliverance. One is commanding the spirits to come out. Two is when they're releasing out. Between one and two, what's happening? The demons have power and they are resisting. But one thing you must know, every time you speak commanding the demons to come out in the name of Jesus, you're having an effect upon them. And that's good. You're having an effect upon them, and, but it hasn't driven them out yet. So what's the smart thing to do? You keep commanding them to come out, as the scripture says, if they don't come out rather quickly, get them to cough out with deep breathy coughs, so they start helping to release these spirits to come out of the person. Also, another thing that you do, and which you have done already in the teaching, which I have done in the teaching, is that we always tell people about the network of spirits and how we're going to continually pursue these entire network of spirits, casting them out time after time until they're gone. We saw that little by little, they're driven out little by little, and that's what God wants. We also see that this is something that we're going to be doing to drive all the enemies out. And we've seen this scripture in the past, but we'll look at it again today in 2 Samuel 22. In verse 38, David's psalm of thanksgiving for deliverance from his enemies, this is what he says. I have pursued mine enemies and destroyed them and turned not again so I've consumed them. We stay on the attack. We keep on casting them out. We keep on casting them out. We don't draw back whatsoever. I've consumed them and wounded them. They could not arise, yea, they're fallen under my feet. We keep on doing it until you get rid of them all. And so you keep on pursuing, casting out the spirits. Now, how do I know when they're free? A lot of people out there in deliverance circles have not understood this. They just think that, oh, hey, your, your pain's gone, great, you're free. Oh, you feel a little bit better? Oh, I have peace now, I'm free. I remember one guy years back, he says, boy, I feel peace, I'm totally delivered. I said, no, you just have seen demons come out so you're not having the tormenting effects, but that's not all the demons come out. You just had a little bit come out. I worked with them some more and showed them how the demons were continually coming out. Otherwise, your gauge for whether you're free is not whether there's a change physically, mentally, emotionally, whatever it might be, my pain's gone. That doesn't mean all the demons are gone. That means that you've gotten some out to the point where they're not causing that problem. But that doesn't mean all the demons are gone yet. How do we know when all the demons are gone? When you get no more release of spirits coming out of you when you work on that area. And that might be a long-term process with no symptoms whatsoever. I've shared the testimony before and to share it again of the one man who had the liver cancer and we cast out for 30 days driving the cancer spirits out of this person and then he was, he, he, his uh, tumor marker test came down to normal, they saw no more cancer, he gained all his weight back, his John just left, he was, uh, went to the doctor and the doctor said he saw no more cancer active in him, he comes in and says I'm healed. I said praise God for where we've gotten to but you're not finished yet because the spirits are still there that a lot, a lot we've cast out so many of them to the point where you've got to where you are, great. But we were casting them out yesterday, watch what happens today. So I began to cast the spirits out. They kept coming out with the yawns and the coughs. And he said, okay. And I said, you need to be, we have to keep casting them out because if we don't, what remains in you will cause the resurfacing of this. We worked another month and it came down even farther in his PSA test. And another month, and his PSA test was even lower. And then another month. We worked three more months on that man with no symptoms at all. Felt like he was in perfect health. Yet the demons kept coming out of him. And the guy, you know, lived 25 plus, you know, years plus, you know, long, long life as he driving out the enemies. So the key is we keep casting them out until there's no more releases of the spirits coming out of us. Now, sometimes you can have spirits say, well, I did that a little bit and I don't see anything coming out right now. That doesn't mean necessarily that they're all gone. I've had people say, well, I, I worked on that, I feel great, and I didn't get any release of those spirits. Not necessarily means they're all gone because the demons, you must understand, as it says in Matthew 12, 45, there's ones that are more wicked than himself. And I've seen lots of testimonies and I heard lots of testimonies, even heard it from a person here recently, 
that said how they were casting out spirits out of himself, working on the, with the cast out se sessions and commanding the demons to come out. And they had gotten to a place where they weren't seeing any response of anything using the cast out session uh, on, they were working on themselves. Uh, and they saw no response of anything coming out at all. And, but they were working on other areas. And then they went back to this months later and they saw more coming out. That's because as they were progressing in the deliverance, more she, they were getting, he's getting freer and freer and freer, but they can come up with, and there can be other ones that are stronger, more wicked than some of the other ones, and they haven't all come out yet. Usually what happens, the weaker ones will come out first, and the stronger ones, of course, as you're penetrating, knocking out the network, the stronger ones will come out later on. And so, you continue to cast out the spirits until you see no more release of the spirits. Now, if you have a cancer case, or you have a severe case, something that could be a terminal thing, or a really serious situation, you definitely need to be working that consistently every day, casting it out, because you want, I don't care whether you didn't get any response today, keep working on it. You know, you maybe don't work on it every day, a couple days later, work on it again. You want to keep working on it because you want to get all the spirits out until they're all gone, and that's important. The next thing that we must do is we must instruct the people to walk in the ways of the Word of God and correct the sin areas. We certainly can't continue to walk in the ways of sin and think that we're going to retain our deliverance. That's another thing. People have not been instructed as they should. Let's say you've got a sin area that's really affecting you. Hebrews 12.1 says, Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us. God wants you to deal with that sin. And what does He tell us to do in verse 4? He says, You've not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. The word striving means fighting and struggling against it. God wants you to fight against the sin so you don't yield to it. You know, you can't say, well, the devil's making me do it. The devil's influencing you, but you have to choose to yield to him in order to let this happen. Now, some people, well, I really got a lot of problems, you know, and I'm not, I just keep on yielding to this thing. You know, some fleshly thing rises up or whatever it might be. You keep casting out. You'll stay aggressive at it. Do the best you can. Let's say like in the area of nicotine. I've seen, this is the, the, the a lot of people say, well, you got to quit cold, cold turkey, and then that's it. Uh, I, not necessarily. I've dealt with lots of cases. I remember one particular woman. I told her, start minimizing this as much as you can every day and work against this and keep casting out aggressively every day. The more she cast out, the weaker the overall thing was getting, but it still had a hold over and she couldn't get free of it yet. And she started minimizing it and cutting it down. But I said, you stay after it every day. And you keep casting it out. And you know, if you have a couple cigarettes or whatever all, it's not the end of the world. Keep casting out and keep doing everything possible to resist that and not give place to that. They stayed after it, and after six months, they were free of it, and it was eliminated in their life. You know, the best thing, of course, is try to do the best you can. But some people, you know, some of these addictions are so strong that it's just, you know, they're really working at you. But if you will keep casting out aggressively, you'll break through that. And as you're in the Word and getting stronger, and as they're getting weaker and weaker, you'll be able to come to the place of putting that underfoot and not yielding to it and driving them out. Of course, the best thing is to get rid of something if you can, totally not yielding to it. But at the same time, though, the ball game is you got to clean house on all those spirits till they're all gone, and you stay after them very aggressively till they're put underfoot, and that is important. So they need to correct the sin areas in their life and strive and fight against sin. Also, <clears throat> they need to walk in line with the Word of God to bring forth the fruit. Be a doer of the Word. Hear and a doer of what the Word says in whatever the answer is to the particular problem and not giving place to those sin areas any longer. Also, they need to eliminate hindrances to deliverance. Of course, not only walking in any kind of sin, but also any kind of unbelief, you know, or any kind of fears. Maybe they've got a lot of fears. Well, we're casting out spirits of fear. That's great. But, you know, you've got, you got to get the Word in you on fear not and walking free from fear and doing what the Word says so you don't give place to fear. What's going to happen? The spirits of fear will come back in. We've got to correct all those areas. A lack of repentance, you know. You can't sit there and continue in ways and think that you're going to walk in victory. No, you've got to repent. Rebellion to God and authority, you know, or disobedience in other areas. We, we've got to really be serious about walking in line with the Word. We can't be lazy and passive and I'll do, I'll do whatever I feel like it. No, God wants us to be diligent and consistent. That is important. Or the person who wants, I want God to do it, you know, and God will just take care of this. No, He's going to do it as you do it with your participation, acting on the Word of God. Also, other hindrances, a lot of times people haven't been established in deliverance principles and don't understand. 
and they, they thought, well, I thought, I, was, I thought everything would be fine. No, if they understand the deliverance principles, and they've been thoroughly taught, which is what I take the time to do, then they're going to know what they need to do. And they've got to be diligent and be steadfast in the deliverance and long-suffering towards circumstances until the person is free. Now, how do we del do deliverance from here? here? The way we do deliverance is the way that God has instructed me, and I believe God has given me wisdom. We do things according to the Word and according to the things that He's shown me to do. First of all, I don't do deliverance in open meetings very often, except for if I'm going out and doing a seminar. By the way, if I do do a seminar, the way I've always done it is this. I will first of all take my little deliverance questionnaire forms that I have, and I will pass them out to everybody that comes in, and I'll have them circle all that information while they're getting ready. And then I'll begin to minister deliverance to them based on this at the end of the meeting. So after they've, first of all, gone through and written down what they have, so why would I want to do this? So I know what specific areas of need are in their life. Maybe we've got someone that's got cancer. I, wanna, if I see the cancer on there, I say, hey, this person, we need to really attack those areas. We've got to minister to the specific needs in a person's life. And all these, so I have them circle the problem areas. Then what do I do next? I start teaching them on the Word, on deliverance thoroughly, and then I would answer questions when I would do seminars. And after that, when everybody's questions were answered, because I want to be sure they understand and they're ready to go, then we begin to minister deliverance to them. And I would go around and I would take everybody's questionnaire and start casting out the demons. And I would do it in mass with a, a microphone on so it was hitting everybody in the place. But also I'm ministering to every single person in that place, getting the demons coming out of all of them on the specific areas of need in their life. Because it is important that you minister specifically to the needs in person's life. I'm not going to sit up here and just call out a bunch of stuff and, well, if it hits you, it's good. And if it doesn't, so what? No. We're, we don't do it that way. We're going to be specific on the specific areas of needs because that is wisdom. That's going to hit the mark on the problem areas you have. And this is important because I've been to deliverance meetings in the past. I remember one particular one and all, all these uh, rather n noted uh, people in the area of deliverance ministered there. And basically they just did this where they're calling out whatever and they had no earthly idea what was going on in the people's lives. And I even heard the people around at the end saying, well, I sure didn't get any deliverance. I drove all this way. I drove five, one, one, I remember, she said, I drove 500 miles and I didn't get any deliverance at all. I don't understand. And they think maybe God didn't want to deliver me. No, God wanted to deliver them. The people didn't have wisdom in how they approached it because they didn't find out the people's needs. They didn't do what was necessary to meet them and to minister to them. What I would do when I do seminars, I would go and I would work with everybody in the place. I w I'd work with two or three hours, no matter how long everybody and work their sheet to cast out and God told me that if I didn't get the demons coming out of everyone I'm going to work with everyone I get an F I don't pass the test <laughs> because I was not effective we have to be effective and I'm very demanding and very intense about this and for all workers I'm demanding and intense and expect everybody to do what's necessary which means we're going to cast out the specific areas of need in a person's life and that is very important so, we want, so that's why we do what we do, and uh, very important that we see that we see the victory come forth in people's lives. Uh, and to give you another example, that sometimes people have a tendency, well, I, I got my way of doing it. No, we're not going to do it that way. You're not going to do it that way here, that's for sure. Uh, like I had, I'll tell you what happened one time. It was I had to go out of town, and I wanted to, people said, well, we want to have the deliverance while you're out of town. So, so some people that were in our church, they said, all right, we'll, we'll take care of it. We'll do it. Great. And they had been trained and taught in what to do. Well, did they do what I told them to do? No. They were not ministering the way I told them to consistently to people. They ended up focusing on one person a whole lot. And I, when I came back, one person comes, hey, I went for the two hour, we had two hour sessions then. I went to the two hour session and they only prayed for me one, just for a very short time. And they were praying for these other people and they were kind of ignoring me and said, you know, I didn't get hardly any deliverance. I thought, you want to know what happened. I said, thank you for telling me. That person never was ministering with me again, that's for sure, because they didn't follow directions, and they were not sensitive to the people and not ministering the way they have to be. We have to do things that are right. People sometimes drive long ways here. They could, they've taken time out of their schedule, and they're coming to receive deliverance. We must be sensitive to minister to the specific needs in their life and to work on them, and we want to work on them consistently. It's really important, and that's what the Lord has always shown me to do. 
So that's the way we minister to people, so we want them to see that they get an effective deliverance every time that they come. Now, another thing. The way we do deliverance here, you notice that people come up. I don't just minister deliverance just to someone, you know, that I've never met or, or you know, that I haven't had a chance to sit down and talk to. Why? Several reasons. Number one, I'm going to give you one t testimony since I've been here. This is way back in the beginning in 2010. A woman came and she had a lot of pain and uh, she wanted to get delivered. And I wanted to make an appointment with her, but she said she didn't have time to make an appointment. And, uh, you know, she had just pain in her body and so forth. So I to just told her, well, yeah, I'll cast out the demons because she had a lot of pain. So I went ahead and cast out some of the demons out of her, and her pain was lessened, but she had a lot of things. She had, I think, I forget what, she had tumors or whatever, but cast out a lot. She was better. And, but it wasn't all gone. I told her it was a deliverance of process. We need to be working on this. You need to make an appointment and so forth. Well, she didn't have the teaching yet. She goes back to her pastor and tells him what happened. The pastor, pastor says, that's wrong. Christians can't have any demons. That was, a, that was wrong. That wasn't any good at all. You shouldn't be doing that. And convinced her that that was wrong, and she never would come back. Now, what was the mistake there? The mistake there was, I shouldn't have really done that. And I determined after that, I'm not going to do that anymore. I don't, if they're, not in, they're in pain, I, you know, either I got to take the time and teach that person and help that person get the teaching on it because if you don't get the teaching and receive it just because, you know, just to get ministry or whatever without having the teaching, are they going to get anywhere? No. And I've seen this happen many, many times. I've seen it and heard testimonies of it from people all over the country that have been to all these different deliverance ministries and the, oh, they got, got, got free of their pain and then it shows up, shows up again, comes back, more problems, thought they were healed and they weren't healed and so forth, and then they, get, they have a faith fall, and then they think, well, deliverance doesn't work. In many circles, deliverance has gotten a bad name because of a lack of wisdom of how to approach things. So, the way we do things here is I make an appointment first with an individual. That's good because of several things. Number one, I can sit down in a confidential, personal time, get to know the person, talk to them about the problem areas in their life specifically. I can interact with them, and I give them a teaching on the subject of deliverance, I answer their questions, and I drive home all these important points so that they understand what's necessary and what needs to be done in the deliverance. And then, of course, at the same time, I'm going to spiritually locate them like we talked about. I'm going to find out, hey, are you walking right? Are you born again? Well, I'm not even born again. Well, we're going to help you get born again. You know, uh, we're not going to minister to them if they're not born again. Or maybe, like the one I said, was living in sin, you know, in fornication. We're not going to minister to that person. So you've got to find out all those facts. So you're going to spiritually locate them. Uh, you're going to be able to thoroughly teach them and answer questions, which I, which I do, and also get them to the place where they're in faith ready to go. And also then we discuss the details of the problems that they have. Sometimes they might have had the deliverance questionnaire. Oftentimes, though, I just sit down and talk to them about all the things that have happened in their life. They might bring a list in. Uh, we talk about things that have happened from inheritance. We talk about things in their childhood. We talk about things that have happened at any time in their life. And uh, go through also a listing of different problem areas they have. I have a basic listing, which is similar to what's on the, de the deliverance questionnaire form that I've used for years. It's in my mind. I ask people all these different categories and questions to find out all these different areas where spirits are to get a pretty good basic uh, understanding of what spirits are in a person. And that's what you want to get. I get a listing of those spirits, get an idea of all the problems. I see the, find out the specific needs in their life. And this is important because what does God want us to do? Lamentations 2.14. Thy prophets have seen vain and foolish things for thee, and they have not discovered thine iniquity to turn away thy captivity. We've got to find the iniquity roots. So that's why we talk to people about their problems, you know. Maybe they have some situations going on, we find out some sin areas, or what came down the inheritance line, or they were victimized in life, they might have gotten molested, or whatever, so all kinds of terrible things, been abused in life. We find out if they have patterns that are going on. Yeah, I've been abused a whole lot. Oh, you've been abused not time after time after time? You've got demons not only of abuse, but you've got demons drawing abuse to you. You won't find that out unless you talk to the person and you discover. So it's like discovery process of finding out what all spirits are in a person. So as you do that, then I minister to that person one-on-one -on -one in that first session. Get the demons coming out, working with them for quite a period of time, get the demons coming out, 
and help them to understand deliverance and get them going forth on the area of deliverance in their life. I also then, having done that, I can invite them to our Saturday sessions if they want. It's available for those that would like to come. But also, because deliverance is an ongoing process, what I do is we have all these cast-out sessions that the Lord had me make in order to, for them to use those to cast out the spirits out of themselves in specific areas. It also helps them to learn what all spirits are in them. Let's say they had some problems in their mind. Well, we start casting out the demons that we, we know are in them. But then I would recommend the mind cast out one that has some 200 uh, different spirits that are addressed on that. And as they're using that, they're going to discover a whole lot more that might be there. And so we're beginning to get the entire, discover the entire network of spirits that would be in a person to start cleaning house on everything. So I tell them about those. We now have 53 different subjects, and I'll be making more. And these are all on specific areas where people can use those to cast out. And so we also encourage them to use those to help cast out consistently daily because you get tired of talking after a while, but the, those, those tapes, those CDs can play forever. And also, then, of course, you can do this day after day after day. You can do it, you know, six times a day if you want, whatever you want to do. And so and we also tell them to write down the prob things that they discover from using the cast out CDs consistently. See, this is just wisdom. Wisdom is spend the time with the person, teach them thoroughly. Start find out all the problem areas, start ministering to them, and start making other ways where they can keep on working on casting out, and we tell them to keep doing this. And of course, most all of you that are involved in the deliverance, you're doing these things. You understand what we're talking about. And so you use these cast outs, and you're discovering more areas, you're driving them out, you know, and for those of you interested in coming, it's available on the Saturday sessions, so we work and cast out the spirits. So this is going to be very effective. I also, of course, make myself available to monitor their progress, to work with them, to talk with them, to be available to answer questions, and to help them on an ongoing basis. Now, regarding the Saturday deliverance services, this is for those only that have first-time appointments. I don't want them coming in there without having a first-time appointment. In rare cases, I will allow them to. I did so recently not with someone because they'd already been over to another place and had some deliverance, and they were going out of town in two days back to where they lived, and I didn't have, they didn't have time to make an appointment, and they'd already had some deliverance, and I already talked to someone who had ministered to them, so they understood basic things. It's not as good as having a chance to really sit down and talk to them, but we did minister deliverance to them, but rarely, usually we do not do that at all. Now... When people come in for the deliverance, we instruct you to work on yourselves and to you bring your list of your problems and begin to command those spirits to come out. Now, regarding people that work in the deliverance, we have many, several that work in the deliverance, and we want to make this clear for everybody, the instructions for everybody, and for anybody that ever would want to get involved. This would be for the future. Anybody would come. Uh, the, for workers of deliverance, we need to follow instructions. Number one, we aren't going to sit down and teach them when they come in. The deliverance sessions are for casting out, not for deciding that we're going to teach them or give them a pep talk or talk to them about some things. We don't do that. That's not the purpose of it. The purpose is to minister to them on the specific areas of need in their life. Why don't we want to do that? Because they've already been taught. They don't need to be retaught. They don't need a pep talk. They don't need your little go talking and all this kind of stuff. We don't do that. And we're, not, and we're not going to have that. I've seen sometimes we've had that, but we're not going to have it anymore. I'm going to really put my foot down on this, and I'm going to make sure that we're working on the specific areas for anybody who's going to be a worker, otherwise they won't be a worker with me. Secondly, when we go to the people, we want to work on their lists. We want to work on the things that they have. And we're going to make a little bit of adjustment. One of the things that we have, a lot of people bring their lists, but a lot of people forget their lists. Well, I'm going to start making copies of all their lists so I have a second list, and I'm going to be placing the list, and I'm going to keep those so that when a person comes, then here's your list, you know, so we can be working on you, and so the workers that are working can go right along, and so this is going to be very effective, and they can get your list and start working on those particular areas. So we want the person to take their list and begin to cast out the spirits at the same time. If someone says, well, I, I'm really have, I, this problem has shown up and I'm really working hard on this, you know, great. We want you to tell the worker, you know, this is a problem. I'm, oh, I got a headache today. Let's work on casting out the headaches in conjunction with everything else. Good. So you'll pound away against those spirits and casting them out. And that's just wisdom to help them to get set free. 
Now some people say, well, if you're always working on the list, are you hindering the Holy Spirit? No, you're not hindering the Holy Spirit at all. As you're working on the list, you're driving things out, and sometimes the Holy Spirit will bring you revelation of specific, specific things and bring things to you, which is, happens a lot. And then you speak, you cast those out in conjunction with what you're working on the list because you might discover more things. Or maybe they come in, and we want to encourage all you that come into the deliverance sessions that maybe, maybe you've discovered some things off of maybe some of the cast out sessions or whatever, you know, and you bring those in and you say, oh yeah, I got some more things to work on. You know, several people that come in and, hey, there's another, this is a bunch of things that I've been working on, and if you work on these and help me with this area, it's great. We'll work on casting out those in conjunction with the list to help drive them out. Because what's our goal? We're going to minister to the specific needs in a person's life and help them to be driven out. Now, another thing. Now, we don't want people and the workers coming and saying, well, I've got this great revelation and I've got this list of things over here. Hey, would you like to, uh, let's, well, I'm going to work on the list on this that I brought today and ignore their other list. You're not going to do that. We're not going to have that. Anybody that wants to do that, they're not going to be working with me. It's going to be firm because we want people to be working on the list and you're not going to bring another list in and then uh, I'm talking about of something that, well, I've got this great list about Jezebel. Well, that may not be the person's problem, you know. Now, say, well, what should, can I do anything with that list? Sure. If you have a list and you say, I'm interested in, um, uh, you know, make anybody that might be interested in this. I got this list of spirits I've been casting out, and I've been working on myself, and it's been a blessing, and anybody would be interested in it, it's available for you. You don't tell them they got to get it. You just ask them if you're interested, and they say, hey, I'd like to have a copy of that. We'll make a copy for you. And, get, and so they can take it home, they can work on it. But are we going to work on that in the session? No because we're going to minister to their specific needs that they are expecting us to minister to, that they need to. We're not going to go play fact-finding or, or demon-finding by going through some other list. That's not going to happen anymore. That, anybody that wants to do that, they're going to be eliminated from working. We're going to be very firm on this because we want to be very effective. Again, people are coming and they want to be set free and they got some big-time needs in their life. And that's the way we're going to do things. And also, we want to be diligent. So all the ones that are workers, the way we're going to do this is we want you to be a worker, if you're in the ones that are workers, and be ready to go and to minister to the people. And also, we minister to the people for a little while, you know, and then move to the next person and move to the next person, move to the next person. If we got four or five of us around in the square over there in the room, then, hey, we're, we're, work, we're working consistently. You know, I'm working with everybody little bit by little bit. You've, you've been in there. You see how I do it. I'm all business. I'm very aggressive. I make my mouth work consistently. It's all out attack. I don't stop and talk to anybody. We're not going to have anybody talking to them or carrying on. You can talk to them afterwards. You're not going to do it during the deliverance times. We're going to be ministering deliverance to them and working st steadfastly so they get good deliverance. I've seen times when people, th they're just sitting for long times. That's not going to happen anymore. We're not going to have that any longer. You're going to, the workers, you're going to work and do it the way I'm telling you to do it, or you're not going to work with me. And I'm very firm on that. We're going to do things right. And some of the people, I see some of the people nodding your head back to, you know what I mean? When, I mean? I'm very sensitive to that. I try to work as fast as I can, as hard as I can, to get to people, every person around there. And when I see someone sitting for a while, you know, I say, I, it's not good. And it's all, sometimes they'll tell the workers, go over and work with that person. What we really like to do, we want to get a worker on every side. We have four or so, four or five workers, and they're going down the line, and they're going down the line, and we're going just in a square, we're going around, and we're ministering to people consistently. What's that going to do? That's going to make it very effective. We're going to be effective, and we're going to be helping people to get delivered, and nobody's going to be sitting, and we're really going to be effective in all the things that we do, and that's important. So, just wanted to let you know how we're going to do things for you who have been workers. We want to you to be a worker. And we're expecting you to come in line with this. And all the other people that want to be workers, we encourage you to be a worker. If you'd like to get involved in being a worker, you will get, of course, we want you to be trained up in the Word. Everybody that's a worker needs to have been in this, in the, hearing the teaching on deliverance and be involved in the deliverance. They need to hear the teaching on deliverance thoroughly. They also need to be working deliverance in their life, of course, and then come and be ready to cast out the spirits and drive them out. And that's important. So, as we do this, then we're going to see God really doing great things. And we're going to minister to people's needs, and we're going to see a lot of effective work get accomplished for people. And that's one of the things we want to do. And so I brought this forth today because, number one, I want this to be for known clearly how we should minister deliverance. 
So we're not doing anything contrary to the word and we're being effective in everything that we do. And also that we're ministering to the people that come and we're real people are everybody that comes is going to get a lot of deliverance. It's going to be a really a good, good uh, time. They're going to get a lot and we're not going to, you know, just focus on one or two people or whatever and kind of some of the other people don't get worked on and not saying that happens, but we want to be sure that we're being consistent and really being effective in what we do. So I shared this all today for several reasons. Of course, you want to be sure that you spiritually locate people. You just don't just minister to someone however you want, whenever you want, you know, you know well, this person has a need. Well, are they born again? Well, I don't know. Well, don't compromise on it. You've got to be sure we do things right or actually they're going to get worse. So I trust this has been a help to you and also it's going to help uh, uh, in ministering deliverance. And again, for those of you who want to come to the sessions, they are on Saturdays. First of all, you have to have made an appointment with me first to sit down and talk to you about the specific areas, and then we'll start ministering to you and helping you, praise God. And for all the workers, we're expecting you to follow this. Anybody who wants to be a worker, we want you to take hold of this and see God uh, you know, get you involved, and we encourage you to take the same thing and apply it where you, wherever you're doing, because God wants you to be a deliverance worker wherever you are and to minister, but you gotta take the time with people and we got to do things the right way, and then we're going to see great results. Say this, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father in, the Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your word that reveals how we minister deliverance effectively to believers. We do not minister deliverance to unbelievers. We minister them to believers, and I thank you. I will be a doer of this word, and I will minister effective deliverance in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God for all that he's accomplishing. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, praise the Lord. And again, if anybody wants to be involved as a deliverance worker, please come and see me because we love to talk to you and get you involved because, um, you know, and also, you know, we understand some people don't have time. and We understand. But go, uh, go out and minister to other people. Use, use everything that God has taught you and be a vessel for the Lord to flow through and watch God do great things. And keep working on yourself consistently. God is going to bring forth great deliverance in all of our lives. We're going to get free, and we're also, we want to share this and witness to other people and help them to come to the same knowledge so they can get free of the problems as well. Father, thank you for there'll be much fruit as we hear and do this word. We praise you for all that you've accomplished, what you brought forth. We'll be doers of it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. Need prayer? Come forward. Want to get involved as a worker? Come see me. God bless. Have a great week as you're a doer of the word. God bless. You're dismissed.